Hello everybody, Brad the Autologist here. Uh, it's Friday again, which means it's shit post Friday. Which is about all I've been posting uh, really lately anyway, so might as well be shit post every day for the moment. Um, I do have some guitars hung up at my new place, as you can see behind me. Um, I've, got, I've got one wall done, I've got to do the other wall opposite to get some, some more stuff hung up that doesn't have cases. So, um, But I thought what I would talk about today, I've been asked... Um, I've actually put out feelers in a couple of past videos, you know, for questions that you might ask if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted me to do like an FAQ type of video or, you know, that sort of thing. I thought what I might do today, since I've been asked this a few different times, uh, also in emails and things, uh, people seem curious about it. I thought I would talk a little bit about my musical influences over the years. And also along the way, maybe talk a little bit about... Uh, uh, about musical gear, some of the musical gear that I've had in the past or gotten in the past or that expired, inspired me in the past, and also the way I feel today about musical gear and how that's different um, from when I was little. My first real memory um, encountering a guitar was when I was probably about three years old. My dad had borrowed a what must have been I don't even know what it was but it must have been some kind of cheap uh, Martin knockoff he had borrowed it from a neighbor of ours that lived about a quarter mile down the road we, we grew up on I grew up on a farm and at this time I lived in a little house that wasn't on the farm he, we rented a different house uh, in closer to town but he had borrowed it from that neighbor that lived close to our farm and I didn't even know this. I thought it, I just always thought it was my dad's guitar, but it was. Uh, it always sat in the corner. He never played it. It was just kind of there always when I was real tiny. And I remember walking up to that thing and kind of just looking at it in awe. You know, it's like, what is that? Um, it makes strange noises when I uh, touch. It's almost like a you know Rush twenty one twelve or something. What is this? It makes strange noises. Uh, but it was exactly like that. It's like I was three years old, maybe. Um, and yes, I do remember things from when I was, I don't remember things from last week, but I remember shit from when I was like two and three, um, which I know seems odd. And you're probably thinking, ah, you don't remember any of that stuff for real. You just remember it because people told you. No, I actually remember things from when I was real tiny. Um, some weird shit too. But yeah, man, I remember this guitar just kind of sitting in uh, my parents' bedroom. Uh, we had one of these weird layout kind of houses where, you know, you had to walk Sometimes you had to walk from through the bedroom to get to another room sort of thing. So it was kind of an open sort of floor plan, plan. But he had this guitar in there and I would walk up to it, you know, and I would strum it with my thumb um, or my fingers or whatever, you know, kind of in the middle, uh, you know, you would strum it like this and you'd be like, oh, you know, and I distinctly remember, um, you know, just, just strumming like open chord stuff. Uh, and then after a while, you know, I kind of like realized that the closer I, the closer I got to the bridge, you know, it made this, this different tone, and I was always fascinated with that as a little tiny kid. And then I also remember doing this, you know, if you've never done something like this, I'm sure everybody has, but. Plucking up here behind the, uh, you know, behind the nut. Um, not even knowing what a nut was or what I was doing, you know, I remember just kind of plucking up behind the nut and getting all these weird little eerie, you know, things going on and my my mind was thinking, you know, oh, that reminds me of some horror movie, you know, I caught a glimpse of or something my parents were watching I wasn't supposed to be peeking in on or whatever, you know what I mean? It's little things like that. I remember very early kind of associating sounds that I had heard on movies and stuff with the little sounds I was making on this guitar by accident, you know? So that was kind of my first experience with, um, oh, you know, realizing uh, I could make noise or I could make music. Uh, even though my dad never picked this thing up, I don't have a single memory of him ever picking this guitar up, but it sat there in this corner and I touched it way more than he did. So that was kind of my first um, experience with a, with a guitar or any instrument really for that matter. Um, a little bit later on, my parents got divorced but when I was about eight or nine years old. My dad lived on a, on a farm and my mom mo had moved to town uh, and I lived there with her and my two sisters. But we would go visit my dad on the weekends and, um, you know, he had some record albums uh, that we would listen to and he only had probably about maybe 20 or 30 uh, albums. So it was, that was all you had. Um, we didn't, 
have really any big stores. At this time, we were in the middle of the sticks, really. So there was there was no Walmart within driving distance. There was none of that stuff. It was, I mean, you're talking uh, mid '80s, you know. So um, we just didn't have any of that. We didn't have access to a whole lot of uh, music, really. And what was there was what my dad had probably picked out when he was younger, you know. Um, some of the stuff I'll show you. Some of the stuff that um, I've actually got. Uh, most of his old albums. Uh, I'll show you some of the selections. Some of the earliest stuff that uh, I remember ever listening to uh, was Alabama. Uh, this band came out, I think, around the time I was born-ish, or, or shortly thereafter. They kind of were big in the early 80s, and my neck of the woods, especially, um, and all across the South, really, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, but Western Kentucky, they uh, had played there a few times, I think, early and very early in their career down around Paducah, Kentucky. And um, my parents had gone to shows, and I, I actually, one of the first concerts I think I ever went to was an Alabama show. But we had all this stuff, um, you know, mountain music. I remember all that and uh, listening to it and singing it. You know, when the, when the uh, family would get together, they would always have me sing for them. Which I guess I must have had some kind of talent at that age um, for that sort of thing that I don't really remember, but they did always have me sing. Uh, probably the, um, one of the biggest that he had that I listened to most was this. Um, he had this Hank Williams, and it's got a lot of good stuff on it. I mean, it's got Bucket's Got a Hole in It, um, Moaning the Blues, Lost Highway. Um, you're gonna change and I'm gonna leave um, all kinds of stuff man and but the uh, about the only ones I ever listened to were I saw the light which I was obsessed with that song for some reason I would always put that on why should we try anymore is good lonesome whistle so I mean this has got a lot of good stuff on it but I um, remember taking this thing out and this is the actual album that he had I remember taking this thing out and just and looking at it the gatefold and reading the uh, reading the inserts and everything and checking out his his get up here which was just incredible to me you know not that I was um, not that I was really even understanding the difference between country music styles or or rock or anything like that I, I, at this time I really didn't uh, I don't know if I understood any of that I just saw heard this album and heard some of the stuff on it and was just enthralled by it and to this day um, just, I, I listen to this quite a lot. Another one that was always around was this. Um, Elvis, Aloha from Hawaii via satellite. Um, I didn't listen to all of this all of the time. I would listen to Hunk of Burning Love and, uh, or Big Old Hunk of Love, however, whatever it is. Um, there was some good stuff, really good stuff on this. Um, you know, but I, I was used to the radio versions of a lot of his stuff, like Blue Suede Shoes and stuff, and Hound Dog. So I didn't really listen to those too much on this live version. But there was one thing on here that I listened to quite a lot, and that was American Trilogy. And uh, you know, I, I, I guess I must have been influenced a lot by uh, church music because I, I was raised Baptist, and I did um, go to church quite a bit when I was a kid. And uh, you know, if you've ever been to um, uh, Southern Baptist kind of church. There's a lot of songs that are really a uh, folk, folky, uh, really old timey sounding stuff. Um, you know, you get stuff like uh, um, the old rugged cross. You know, as an old standard, you'll get stuff like just as I am. They would always play that at the end to try to get you to cry and come up to the front. Um, and there was something about songs like that that were just deeply moving. I think even if you as a little kid, you know, I had my questions. It's like, okay, well, what is God? And, um, you know, who made God? You know, I, would, I remember sitting there in, uh, in pews wondering, uh, even at a really early age, like, okay, well, if there's a God, I can understand that, but who made God, you know? So I was already questioning things and whatnot, but even still, it didn't matter. Um, songs like that would would just call to you um, and and move you in a, in a way that, and even to this day, when I hear something like that, it's just like, you know, I'll come near near to tears because of, uh, you know, all, all of the things that have happened in the interim between then and now and all the people that have, you know, kind of left my life and 
um, new people that have joined it and all the things, you know, all the poetic things that you think about um, and the spiritual things you think about when you hear a certain song and it just evokes this this deep memory of uh, a time long ago. Um, and that's that's what a lot of this stuff does for me. Um, there was, and then there was another side of it too, which was, uh, which was this, the Ventures. My dad had these uh, two Ventures albums. He had this one, which I think this is the volume, Golden Greats Volume 1. This is Golden Greats, more Golden Greats. This is actually apparently a fairly rare album, the, the more Golden Greats. But this has such good stuff on it. Uh, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly theme. Uh, House, their version of House of the Rising Sun on this, uh, I probably will have played at my funeral. It's so freaking good. Um, the guitar tone on it is just to die for. Um, and you know, one of, I, I think really what this was probably one of the uh, one of the things, one of the bands that really got me interested in listening to guitar music. Uh, for the sake of the guitar, not necessarily for the sake of the song, but listening to the tone of a guitar, uh, Rebel Rouser, Walk Don't Run, all this stuff, it was it's really so guitar oriented. There's a version of Classical Gas on this that is incredible. Um, and I remember listening, I burned that up, I probably have worn that out on this record actually. Uh, when I was a kid, I probably wore it out then. But you know, there, the thing is, there were only a few choices. Uh, the point I'm getting at is there were only a few choices at my dad's house or maybe 20 or 30 records. But from what was there, uh, you know, I would spend that stuff when I was over his house because there was really not a whole lot else to do. We were out on a farm. Uh, if you didn't, you know, if you weren't milking the cow, and which I did actually milk the cow and stuff, uh, you know, all the stuff you would do on a farm with livestock and stuff, you know, we would do. So, you know, when you weren't doing that, there wasn't a whole lot to do. So, um, my stepbrother and I, we would go build uh, clubhouses in the woods. Well, later, a little bit later on, we would go build clubhouses in the woods ourselves. And we were probably, you know, 9, 10, 11 years old, something like that. Um, and they would just let us go. And we'd go way back out in the woods and cut our own wood and, um, you know, chop it all up and actually build clubhouses with it <laughs> something I you know I think most parents uh, probably wouldn't let their kids do now uh, for safety reasons and whatnot I'm not even sure if I would uh, but you know experiences like that are just really uh, invaluable um, you know they're, they're part definitely part of who I am uh, I think my self self-reliance streak uh, my questioning of people who always want government handouts or somebody to take care of them and all this shit um, comes uh, my questioning of that my skepticism of that uh, comes from that it's just like okay I was a little kid romping around in the woods um, you know kind of making my own way I, I actually would carry uh, guns and we would shoot squirrels and we would uh, um, bring them home for dinner we'd have them for dinner that night you know uh, when I was like 10 so it's just to me it, that kind of thing is second nature so so hearing people from the city, you know, bashing gun rights and, um, you know, trying to protect welfare systems and all this shit. It just, for somebody like me from where I came from and um, all that stuff, you got to understand, it's a different world. Um, you're not, uh, you know, your nearest neighbor is like a half mile away. So um, it's, it's just a different world. Uh, and, and for people to judge that or um, that, that people are less intelligent who come from places like that, um, less worthy of uh, consideration or I don't know like there's like there's nothing of value that I mean all of the artists that I just showed with probably the exception of the ventures are rural people um, you know Hank Williams he came from a rural area it's not like he came from the big city uh, Elvis came from a rural area so I mean a lot of the music uh, and culture that we love comes from places that are really humble uh, comes from places that aren't um, you know, a Greenwich, Greenwich Village, um, you know, and that sort of place. It's not Tin Pan Alley, you know, that our, that a lot of our great music came from. But I, I knew that there were a few things that I liked out of my dad's record collection, and I would pick those things out, and I would just burn them up. 
I had to find things that I liked because there wasn't enough, much of it there. Another early experience I remember was going to my cousin's house, and uh, this was probably slightly later in the 80s, maybe 87-ish, something like that. Uh, I went over to his house, and he had a just a, a Ferrari red BC Rich bitch. Um, and he had all the posters on his wall, you know, and he had the denim jacket with all the little buttons and patches and shit for ACDC and Wasp and uh, all this stuff and Dawkin and uh, you know, I remember seeing him wear that jacket to family get-togethers and stuff, and I was like, man, you know, that's cool. That looks cool. What is that? So we, I go. I remember going over to his house this one time and seeing this candy red BC Rich bitch that he had sitting over, you know, by his bed, and he had all these posters on the walls of, of like, Wasp, you know, spitting blood and, uh, you know, Blackie Lawless uh and this and all this stuff and it's like I was like whoa you know i was probably 10 10 years old 9 10 years old and uh i remember looking at it just imagining uh, what it would be like to be able to make uh you know the kinds of noises that he was playing for me out of the stereo on that guitar you know what what would that be like what would that feel like um i didn't actually pick up a guitar i mean my dad bought me a cheapo something out of finger hut or something you know i mean it was like a um it wasn't even a harmony it was just n not even labeled it was worse than a harmony i think it was probably made in taiwan or something like that um you know before before china really took over all the student model stuff this is this guitar was worse than something you would have gotten uh from china today like this is this is lower than the bottom it was unplayable uh, but he got it for me for Christmas, so it wasn't like I was going to say, uh, yeah, you know, take this son of a bitch back. Um, but at the time, I wasn't even interested, really, at the time he got me that. I think he thought I would be interested, and he tried to get me interested, but I wasn't. At the time, I was more into baseball. Uh, so it took a, a couple years. Um, you know, he probably got me that when I was 9 or 10, uh, and it took a few years for me to really start to get interested. I didn't get interested in wanting to play guitar, really until um, I heard Metallica when I was in middle school. Um, I had a friend named Colby who uh, would bring cassette tapes and I guess he had a Walkman or whatever and uh, we would listen to it, you know, at, at, sitting at lunch in middle school um, while all the other kids were concerned with being popular and shit. We were over here get, <laughs> laying the groundwork for becoming a bunch of hoods, uh, you know, a bunch of metal, metal heads listening to um, listening to Metallica's Injustice for All and uh, Master Puppets and, and stuff. Uh, we've, you know, share share headphones and whatnot, you know, to, to listen to it. Um, but I remember just looking at that Master Puppets uh, cover, you know, we, it was all cassettes then, so it was, it was tiny. But you'd look at the Master Puppets cover and be like, wow, that looks cool. And it looks like the music sounds, you know, it looks as cool as the music sounds. Same with Ride the Lightning, you know, he had that album too. So I was like, oh man, that looks awesome. It looks like the guitar tone that's in the album. <laughs> Weird. So I'd associate like the color blue on the, on the, with the guitar tone. Uh, but the first, first thing I ever bought for myself um, was probably uh, Bon Jovi Slippery When Wet a, a few years earlier. And this was uh, before anything was really that popular. I think I bought it on the strength of that You Give Love a Bad Name single. And then I listened to the whole album um, because that's kind of, you know, again, I, I didn't have a lot of money. My parents didn't have a lot of money. Um, so we didn't have a lot of stuff to listen to. So I had kind of had to listen to the rest of the album and like it. Uh, and this is what you did back then. You would buy an album. It's not like buying a single off of iTunes and then putting together a playlist, um, you know, or... or subscribing to Spotify or whatever now and putting together a playlist of everything from the entire catalog of human history. You know, it's, it wasn't that easy. You had to actually listen to deep cuts on an album or a cassette tape. You had to listen to the whole thing because, or, or eight tracks. Hell, you had to listen, you had to like at least a quarter of the eight track, you know, in order to make it worth it because otherwise you were going to sit through a bunch of shit until you got to that one damn song you liked on the whole eight track. Um, which I didn't have much experience with 8-tracks. They were pretty much already gone by the time I was a kid. But, uh, you know, you had to listen to other stuff. And that kind of brings me back to guitar gear. 
Um, if you don't have a lot of money now, it's not that big of a deal because you can walk into a guitar center and you can spend quite little money and get something that's very playable that you can learn on. Um, and you, you know, you're not that likely to give up uh, if you truly enjoy doing it and you want to pursue it. But back then it wasn't necessarily that way. If you bought something real cheap, uh, chances that were really good, you weren't going to be able to play it. But you would try your ass off and you would make do with what you had. Um, you know, and you would try to play that Master of Puppets lick on a piece of shit uh, Dixon Strat copy, you know, that you got. Um, which, you know, granted was playable, but wasn't, uh, you know, the standards were pr fairly low still. Um, but you know, you walk into a guitar center now and there's so many choices, it's just like it's overload. It's sens sensory overload. Um, and it's and it's very homogenous. Uh, you see maybe, you see, you see your big section of Gibsons, and you see your huge section of Fenders, and you might see some Schecters, and then some, uh, maybe a Jackson or two, but only because Fender owns them. Uh, you know, they have three or four colors basically that are their primary colors that they kind of slap on guitars and the Gibson section looks like this and the Fender section looks like these colors and they might have some special colors in there but for the most part still it's Olympic whites and it, you know you get your blacks and Olympic whites and uh, it's not like they're going at overboard on colors um, for their production run stuff they do a lot of special run stuff but that'll get you some weird you know shell pinks and things but um, for the most part you know even fenders with all their colors uh, are fairly homogenous in what they put in the stores um, and then you get your Schecters and stuff like that and it's just all black you know it's, it's either matte black or it's gloss black <laughs> you basically have that or, or every now and then you'll get a, like a wine red see-through wine red or something you know it's just it's the, even the color scheme is just very homogenous looking to me um, the very unlike stuff that came from the 60s, you know, you would get, you would get some different things like with different pickup configurations and companies that were doing their own thing and really, you know, they weren't, um, they weren't necessarily back then, Japanese stuff wasn't trying to be like the American stuff necessarily. It was just, they were doing their own stuff. That's kind of why I gravitate toward this stuff because you can't, you can't really walk into a guitar center today and see something like that. You know, you just don't see it. If you do see it, it's a very rare occasion. Um, and they don't care anything about something like that. So that kind of makes me care about it. Because it's, uh, okay, everybody else has neglected this thing. Everybody else thinks this thing is shit. Let's see how good I can make it. You know, let's see how much skill I have developed. Um, and let's see if I can make this thing playable. I've got some tools. Let's start grabbing weird stuff like this. Because everybody, let everybody else have the Fenders and the Gibsons and the whatever. And it's not out of some hipster need to be different. It has nothing to do with that. It's just, um, it's just seeing something that's humble and trying to resurrect it. Um, you know, or something that's in a poor condition or a poor state and trying to make it into something uh, that someone would value or that I would want to play through, you know, or that would inspire me to play. It's like falling in love with a girl. You know, um, you fall in love with a girl and you kiss her that first time and you hold her, uh, you know, and you, you even feel her breasts ag against you, you know, and it feels, you just feel elated. You feel um, alive for the first time. It's like hearing Stairway to Heaven for the first time. And you get that weird sense of what, or the first, uh, first track of a Black Sabbath album, you know, their first, first album. You know, dun, dun, dun. It's like, and you get that weird, ooh, the eerie sense. Um, but somewhere along, along the line, you know, you listen to that after a couple hundred times or stairway a couple hundred times, and somewhere along the line, you forget the feeling that you had. It's no longer that innocent uh, feeling of coming to something for the first time, you know, or kissing that girl for the first time, or, or me strumming, walking up to my dad's guitar and strumming it like this. For the first time, you know, it, it, you lose that. Some you lose something in your learning. I think is what I'm trying to say. The more technical you get with your playing, 
Um, you know, if you want to slappy dap and do all this stuff that's impressive for a YouTube video, uh, don't get me wrong, I'll, I'll watch some of that stuff too, but um, just crazy shit, you know, that people playing like three or four lines at one time on two or three guitars or, or whatever. whatever. Um, I, I understand people do want to do different things and go out there and more power to them. Um, but, you know, I, to me, that's not where it's at. That's not where the muse is. Uh, the muse is in places, humble places. Um, Places where, you know, Hank Williams would have sat, you know, and come up with those songs um, that just, that at least for me, speak to me on a, on a level I, I, I can't explain. Um, but there's something innocent about that. And if you lose that innocence, if you become jaded with everything, um, you know, it changes. Um, and I think that's kind of what's happened to guitar in general. Um, you know, there's no, there's no Nirvana. There's no somebody to come along and smash it down. It's like, okay, this hairband shit has gotten old. Let's smash everything. Uh, and that's why they're hated a lot. And I, I get that. You know, they, they hit it about the right time for me. Even though I was a metalhead, Nirvana still made it past my screen because, uh, they didn't, almost didn't because the first few times I heard their, for, you know, it smells like teen spirit. I was like, oh, what the, I was like, ah, oh, get that out of my head. Turn that off. I don't want to hear that. You know, this this guy, I can't understand as well. But then after, um, you know, hearing the rest of the album and stuff, it was it was it started to grow on me. Um, but sometimes you have to put down those preconceptions and and listen to something, um, and branch out a little bit. You know, for a kid who grew up on church music and Hank Williams and Elvis and the Ventures. And uh, oldie station was on a lot on, in my mom's car. It was on all the time. So for somebody like that, you know, to go to, first of all to metal like Wasp and and uh, <laughs> you know Metallica and Megadeth and stuff like that, uh, to then go on to try to listen to Nirvana and try to make that acceptable and stuff, you know, it, it's not an easy transition. It, it happens, but it's not easy. I also got a lot into Simon and Garfunkel around the mid '90s. Um, because there was something, again, there was something about it. You know, the oldie station was always on in my mom's car. And every now and then you would get that Simon and Garfunkel song. It was like, you know, okay, you would get Motown, 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 Motown. And then you would get a Simon and Garfunkel song. And that was like, whoa. It's like, okay, that's over here. This is, this has a darkness to it. This has a, uh, something about it that's not, um, you know, we're not trying to make people dance necessarily we're trying to touch people's fucking soul you know with this uh and and it was like okay and as a kid you know sitting in the back seat listening to this it was like you know just dreaming out the side window uh there's that innocence you know again it's back to that innocence thing it's like you hear something like that and it sticks it just sticks with you for the rest of your life you never forget it and that, that was Simon and Garfunkel music too. So a little later on in life, in my guitar development, I, I kind of came back to the Simon and Garfunkel stuff, you know, remembering hearing that in the back of the car and started trying to play all that finger picking type stuff. And that's where I get a lot of my finger picking uh, stuff, influ hugely influenced by that. Um, trying to learn Simon and Garfunkel songs uh, in the mid, mid 90s when I was kind of, you know, first three or four years of playing. But anyway, back to the innocence thing. I think that's why a lot of people, you know, get high to write. You know, people take, they'll smoke a, smoke a duber or something, or they'll take whatever they take, you know, so, some stuff more dangerous than others, and go on their little journey to try to deconstruct whatever it is that's gotten in the way of that innocence. Um, you know, that's what I love about uh, church music a lot, you know, because you don't, you don't really need to de you don't need to take a drug to deconstruct it you um church music is kind of innocent already because you are humbling yourself in a way that uh you know rock music really doesn't do rock music is about bravado it's about like you know i'm a man and i have a dick and i want to stick it in you <laughs> you know what i mean i mean sorry to put it so bluntly but it's uh that's kind of what it's about you know it's that that's rock music it's uh but there's still an innocence even in rock music. Like if you go back and listen to some of the early stuff, it's like they were just figuring out what it was all about, and just figuring out how the beat would uh, 
you know, would hit you. Listen to like some Bo Diddley or something. And then go listen to some Rolling Stones, and it's the same, same kind of thing. Yeah! And it's like a, it's like, ah, you know, it's an explosion. Um, and that's why I like The Doors a lot, too. I mean, that's kind of sounded like Jim Morrison there. That's kind of why I like them, too, because he was just uninhibited. It's just a wild man kind of shit, you know. It's, um, it's like, let's forget who we are, let's deconstruct everything we know, and let's go off over here, you know somewhere in the wilderness or some shit you know forget forget for, try to forget at least about influences even um, in some measure you know you're still gonna have them regardless of what you try to do and people who really try to forget about influences end up sounding like shit they just ends up sounding pretentious it's like you get the you get you know Steve Vai doing like uh, microtones. <laughs> no offense to Steve Vai, he's a great player, but you know, I mean, when you get that far into it, um, it's like you've you've lost you've lost the innocence. You got to have the innocence. That's why I can only listen to like um, I can listen to early Ingve Malmsteen, early stuff like where he was just like full of piss and vinegar, and he's just on stage, just kicking over shit and just and just going for it. Uh, and I can listen to that for about 10 minutes max, and then it's like, okay, now you've gone beyond, um, you, you've, what, what is it? You've lost the innocence. That's what it is. You've lost the innocence. Um, so yeah, don't lose your innocence. Try to keep it. Um, and if, you've, if you have lost it, try to get back to it uh, in a way that doesn't require narcotics. <laughs> Anyway, enough shit post Friday. Hope you guys have enjoyed this one. Uh, I do have a couple things on the bench that I'll, I'll be repairing. Uh, so hit the subscribe button to see that stuff. Uh, also, go to my uh, main YouTube page, The Guitologist, and I have all my old stuff sorted into categories. So if you um, certain things you like to see, you can go see it there. Uh, anyway, thanks y'all for listening, and y'all take care.